Could we, uh, could we first turn to the Gospel of Matthew? So that's the first Gospel in the New Testament in chapter 19. I want to read uh, four fairly short stories in the Bible tonight. And um, all of them are connected in some way. So we'll start Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16. This is the story of the rich young ruler. So Matthew 19 and 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You could turn a couple pages back to Matthew chapter 18, and we'll start at verse 23. Matthew 18 and 23. This is a parable. This is Jesus talking. And he says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold. And his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Now a few books down to the uh, to the book of Acts. Acts and sorry, Acts chapter twenty six. Acts chapter twenty six and verse twenty two. Actually, we'll we'll read a few verses at the start. So we'll start at verse one. Acts 26 and verse 1. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. And then we'll skip a few verses down to verse number 22. And this is still Paul speaking. He's addressing King Agrippa. And he says, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. That Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And then our final reading will be in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 12. Luke 12 and verse 16. And this is a, another parable being told by the Lord Jesus. It says, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, 
Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. God bless the reading of his word. So we've read four short stories tonight of four men. Each of them had pretty differing circumstances, but all of them had one thing in common. And the key word that I want to focus on tonight is that word almost. Maybe uh, you figured it out from the hymn that I gave out, and if so, bonus points. So the word almost. Now, almost can be a good thing or it could be a bad thing. I know when I was in school for engineering, I would have these projects, these technical projects, and they would almost be perfect, you know, almost full marks. And it was really frustrating because it would work mostly well, but then there was always something small that would go wrong, something that I overlooked, something that I missed. So almost was a bad thing. But on the other hand, almost could be a good thing. You know, you could be driving down the highway, you could have a close call with like another car, you forget the shoulder check or something, and you say, phew. That was almost really bad. And so in that case, almost is a good thing. Tonight, we've read about four different men, and each of them were almost at a point. The first man, we read about a rich young ruler. And by Jesus' standards, he was almost good enough. In Matthew chapter 18, we read uh, a parable, and it's of a man in debt to his king. And that man was almost condemned. Thirdly, I want to talk about um, Paul and his trial. He's speaking to King Agrippa. And after his address is finished, King Agrippa says that he's almost persuaded to be a Christian. And then finally, we'll look at Luke chapter 12. We'll see another parable, another rich man, unaware that he was almost out of time. So first, we'll start in Matthew chapter 19. and. I want to talk about a man who was almost good enough. So this, uh, this story actually happens in three Gospels. And if you kind of combine all of the accounts of these Gospels, we can learn a little bit more about this man who comes to Jesus. So this man, he, he had a lot of things good going for him. He was young. He was wealthy. Um, we also read that he was a ruler, which means that he was probably part of the Sanhedrin, which is kind of like the Jewish Supreme Council. It, consisted of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and that council would have had um, civil and criminal and um, religious jurisdiction over the Jews in Israel. And so this young rich ruler he comes to Jesus, and he asks him a very specific question. In verse number um, 16, he says, um, Good master, what good things shall I do that I might have eternal life? Now, the interesting thing is that um, he's not just asking, you know, how can I have eternal life? But very specifically, he was asking what good thing could he do? What It's almost as if he was looking for a task or, you know, some rule to live by, which would guarantee the spot in heaven for him. And so, first of all, Jesus replies... Um, there's none good but one, that is God. He's kind of trying to hint at the fact that, you know, if you want to be good enough to get to heaven, if, if you want your good works to get you to heaven, then really you have to be as good as God himself. You have to be perfect. You have to be completely righteous and holy. But um, we don't read of the, the ruler saying anything. This statement doesn't seem to faze him. So the Lord Jesus goes on and he talks about a few commandments. He says, follow the commandments. And now there's lots of commandments. We have the commandments in the law. We, we would have also had some commandments, you know, made by men, by men, some like legalistic commandments that were not specifically from God, but would have been enforced by the Pharisees. And so the man rightfully asks the Lord Jesus, what commandments are you talking about? And so the Lord Jesus goes through some of Moses' Ten Commandments. He says, um, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, honor your father and mother, 
um, love your neighbor as yourself. And then the young man replies, um, all of this I've done since my youth. I've never broken any one of these commandments that you're talking about. And it's hard to know whether or not he was lying, whether he was telling the truth. No doubt, you know, a man of this stat status, of this, um, of this wealth, he was probably a good man. It's very possible. But then Jesus gives him one more commandment. And he says, sell your possessions, give the money to the poor, and follow me. And it's at that moment that the young man realizes that he wouldn't be able to do that. You know, he, he realizes that he loves his possessions, he loves his money and, and all the things that he had earned too much to give them up for God. He might have been a good man, but he was only almost good enough to make it to heaven. It's very easy to see ourselves as a good person. You know, we compare ourselves to all those stories of criminals that we see on the news or whatnot, you know, other people around us. And we think that we're pretty good. And, you know, you might very well be doing more good deeds than bad deeds in your life. You might go to church and donate money to the poor. You might love your neighbor. You might honor your father and your mother. But, but the thing is, you will never be good enough to make it to heaven off your works alone. Almost good enough is still not good enough. And the problem is, it's not our good deeds. It's, it's our sin. Our sin is what's actually keeping us from, from heaven. Um, a couple months ago, I was walking around Costco, and I saw them selling some fresh herbs. There were four pots of herbs. And I have like... I always like watching cooking shows on YouTube and whatnot. And they always have fresh herbs that they put in. And that looks cool and really fancy, right? So I thought, you know, I'll give it a shot. You know, my apartment's looking pretty drab. It'd be nice to have some greenery to, you know, freshen it up. So I brought home some herbs, put them on the windowsill, you know, did my Google research, how much to water them every day, and uh, what, when to put them out in the sun and whatnot. So I, I monitored them like pretty, pretty well for like the first week or so. And, you know, I watered them, they were growing, they were, they were pretty healthy. So I was pretty happy. Um, and then one day I noticed in my basil plant that it was starting to look a little like patchy, like the leaves, there was like a bit of discoloration. There was these black specks on it. But I was like, uh, it's probably just dirt or something, kind of just kept watering it, didn't really think too much about it. And then as the days went on, it kind of spread. So like other leaves started to get it. And then soon like the entire plant was just covered in these patches and these black specks. And, you know, it even started spreading to like the other plants. So as any other person would do, I checked with Google to see what Google said. And apparently, according to Google, there's, there's a possible infestation to your plants. So there's these little bugs called thrips. And if the thrip gets into your plant, it will burrow into the leaf and it will start eating the sap inside the leaf. And eventually all the nutrients will be sucked out of the plant and it will die. So I was pretty sad because, you know, I put a lot of time into these plants, but just imagine for a moment that I kept on watering them and, and, you know, didn't really worry about the thrips too much. Like, that situation would never have changed. Those thrips would have just kept on eating through my plant. I would have had to go and find some pesticide or maybe someone who actually knows how to deal with plants and get them to deal with it instead. But imagine if I just grew, grew it all and you know just pruned some leaves, chopped up some basil, and I brought it to you and I said, here you go, here's my fresh basil. You can put it in your next salad. What, what would you do? You'd probably say, like, if, you, if I told you about it, if you knew what was wrong with it, you'd say, I, I think I'm good, thanks. Like, you can keep it. And, you know, I could, I could tell you, but, like, I've watered it so much. I've cared for it. You know, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty good. Like, it's just got a small problem. Like, I've watered it so much. I've kept good care of it. But then you tell me, no, the problem is not that you didn't water it enough. The problem is that it's corrupted. It's infested. In the very same way, that's how we are before God. You know, our good deeds, 
we we can focus as much as we want on our good deeds. We can go to church. We can give to the poor. We can try to live our life as righteously as we can. But the problem isn't that we're not doing enough good deeds. The problem is our sin. It's that we've been corrupted and that we've been we've been corrupted by sin and so we can't be let into heaven and so all your good deeds the most that they can ever be is almost good enough they will never be good enough to let you into heaven now let's move on to chapter uh, matthew chapter 18 and here we see a man who is almost condemned and this man is in a very very opposite situation from the first guy the first guy where he was wealthy and he was powerful, he, he had a lot of good things going for him. This man is really, has hit rock bottom. I don't, I don't really think that he could have been in much of a worse situation than he was. And the Lord Jesus talks about a parable of this man and he owes 10,000 talents to his king. When I was young and I was reading through this, I thought 10,000 talents is maybe like 100,000, maybe like a million. I never really understood how much 10,000 talents were. So let me just try to put it into perspective for you. So one talent back then is 6,000 denarii. And one denarius is the equivalent of a day's wage. So that's, you would have paid one denarius to your average manual worker. So let's, let's put it in Ontario standards. So minimum wage is $15.50 right now, I think. So if you work... Um, eight hours a day, that means your day's wage is 124 bucks. That's one denarius. So that means one talent is 6,000 days wages. And one talent itself is already a lot of money. That's like working um, six days a week for 20 years, or maybe working 16 and a half years every single day, no holidays, no weekends. Okay. So one talent, if we do the math, is about $744,000. That's a lot of money. But this man, he didn't just owe one talent, he owed 10,000 talents. And so if you move the decimal a few places, that's actually $7.44 billion. That's a lot of money to owe someone. So if I put it like that, you can really see how much trouble, how much debt that this man was in. And so we read the parable and he comes before his Lord, his debtor, and and the Lord condemns him because obviously he can't pay that much money. So the Lord condemns him to slavery and his family. And maybe the Lord will recoup a tiny fraction of what that man owes him. And what the man does is he pleads for time to repay the debt, which is kind of crazy if you think about it, because it would have taken him several lifetimes to pay that debt. But I guess really he didn't have much other choice. He had nothing really else to offer. But the king has compassion on him. And not only does he, he doesn't just give the man more time because more time would really have been pointless. Instead, he forgives the full $7.44 billion of debt. And this man, you know, he might have thought that all hope was lost. He was almost condemned. He was basically there. Like there was, he probably thought that he would have never experienced another free day in his life. And yet that king forgave him of his entire debt. You know, there's many of us tonight here and we can, we can sympathize with this man and we can, myself included, we can remember a time in which we were almost condemned in which we owed a debt of sin to God, even larger than that man, a debt that could have never been calculated, a debt that even over multiple lifetimes could never have been paid. But just like that king, God has forgiven us of that debt. He has ensured that our sin debt was paid through the death of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, on the cross. And on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ suffered during three hours of darkness. And in that time, he paid for the, the, the debts of sins, of everyone, of the entire world. He paid for the sins that happened in the past and for the sins that happened in the future. And tonight you have that same offer that that man in the parable has had. You have an opportunity to completely erase this massive debt. 
you're being offered a chance right now to escape the eternal condemnation that you rightfully deserve. And there's only one thing you have to do, which is accept the payment that has been made by his son. In Acts chapter 26, um, we read about a man who was almost persuaded. So uh, in Acts, for a bit of context, um, we read of Paul and uh, it, his trial, um, it's, it's kind of a long and drawn out trial. So, and which Paul is in the middle of, and he's kind of in trouble because of his public preaching to the Jews. So you flip back a couple of chapters, you see that he's being um, accused of being a troublemaker, of stirring up riots and of profaning or of disrespecting or um, being irreverent towards the temple. And so he finds himself in front of King Agrippa. And King Agrippa would have uh, been part of the Herodian family. Um, he would have had um, dominion over some of the territories north of Judea. And he would have been pretty familiar with a lot of Jewish customs. Paul even calls him an expert in um, Jewish customs and religion. And, and this is kind of like both a, a de defense for Paul, but also turns out to be a gospel message as Paul talks about his testimony. He talks about how um, he had persecuted the church. And then he talks about how um, he, he repented and he was converted. Um, and then he ends his address in verse uh, 22, chapter 26 and verse 22. And he says, um, he talks about what he was actually doing. He wasn't trying to stir up riots. He wasn't trying to be a troublemaker, but he says um, he was trying to, he was witnessing both the small and great saying none other things than what the prophets and Moses said that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And and then he asks King Agrippa a question. He says, do you believe the Old Testament? Do you believe the pro what the prophets and what Moses said about the Lord Jesus? Do you believe what I have been talking about? And then King Agrippa replies, almost. He says, almost after hearing what you have told me, Paul, you persuade me to be a Christian. Tonight, you're hearing a message very similar to Paul as you're hearing the gospel message. And you know, maybe you've been lucky enough to even hear a few messages in the past. And so I ask the same question to you. Do you believe what you have been taught? Do you believe what the Bible says? Do you believe what the Bible says about who the Lord Jesus is? And have you been persuaded to follow Christ and become a Christian? Or are you just like King Agrippa and you're almost persuaded, but just not quite? You know, I remember being young and sitting in countless gospel meetings, realizing the seriousness of my sins and realizing this massive debt of sin that I owe, just like that man in Matthew. And, and in gospel meetings, I would almost be persuaded. I would, I would feel bad about it and, you know, really think hard about my salvation. But then the meeting ends and I just don't care about it anymore. King Agrippa was almost persuaded, but that wasn't enough. You know, we, we don't really know further on. It doesn't say whether King Agrippa changed his mind, changed his stance or, or anything. But what we do know is that being almost persuaded isn't good enough. Being almost persuaded won't get you to heaven. So maybe you're almost there. Maybe Maybe you almost are a Christian, but there's just something else that's keeping you. It's, it's your preconceived notions. It's things that you've believed before. It's the things that you don't think are true. Or maybe it's your worldly influences, or, or maybe it's the people around you. But whatever it is, one day you're going to stand before God. And at that point, it's not going to matter how many gospel messages you've sat through, how many times you've gone to to meeting it's not going to matter how close you were to getting saved the only thing that's going to matter is whether or not you are actually persuaded to become a christian and to follow christ
Finally, I want to talk about one last person, one last man who was almost out of time. In Luke 12, we read of another, um, of another man, and he had just had a bumper crop. So he had a fantastic harvest, and he had all these grand plans. He was thinking, you know, I'm going to break down my barns. I'm going to build newer ones because I have so much harvest that I don't know what to do with it. I'm just going to be set for a lot of a good amount of time. And then he says to himself in verse 19, Luke 12 and verse 19, he says, Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. You know, the famous eat, drink, and be merry. But then God says, what is all this going to matter? Because tonight your soul is going to be required of you. Tonight you're going to die and you're, you're going to have to atone for your sins. And all these things that, that seem to make um, to be important in your life, they're not going to be important anymore. You know, this man, he had no worries. He had no problems. Everything seemed like it was going smoothly. He could look forward to the next 10, 20 years of of having fun and relaxing and partying. But what he didn't realize is that he was almost out of time. Tonight, it might seem like you have plenty of time. You have plenty of time to deal with your sins. You have plenty of time to make a decision regarding your soul. You might put off a time. Um, you put off salvation until until a time that's more convenient. You know, like the like the song that we just sung at the start of the of the gospel meeting, go spirit, go thy way, some more convenient day, you know, maybe sometime when I actually need God, when I'm in trouble or, or when I'm on my deathbed, then I'll think long and hard about my salvation. But how do you actually know? How do you actually know that you're going to make it to that point? How do you know that you're even going to make it to tomorrow? The Bible tells us that our lives is just like a... Is, vapor it's just like water vapor it's just a puff of steam that is there for a very short moment and then disappears you know there's no better time to get saved than today there's no better time to deal with your massive debt of sin than right now don't be like that young rich ruler and think that you're good enough because in reality you might almost be good enough but that's still not good enough to to get you to heaven and don't be like King Agrippa and be almost persuaded and to put off your sins for another day and, you know, think that I don't need to be saved right now. I'll do it later. And don't be like this man and, and not realize that you could almost be out of time. Your sins are serious and they need to be dealt with. And God has paid off your debt through the death and resurrection of his son. And there's only one thing left to do, and that is to accept that payment, to accept the payment of your massive debt. And, and you can realize that even though you were almost condemned for eternity, you can look forward instead to a life, to an eternity with God in heaven. God bless his word. Let's sing just the first verse in the course of number 26. Come into the sweet invitation of grace. Come unto Jesus, the soul of resting place. Come for his suffering for sin to God. Come to the Father's well pleased to the Son. It's the first verse in the course of 26. Come in the sweet invitation of grace. Come for his suffering for sin is Again, thanks for coming, and you might also have guests tonight, but I'm going to speak on this word, come. And I'll probably close the meeting thinking a little bit about Matthew 11 and 28. Come on to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, 
But I want to speak about the word come from three different perspectives. I want to start out thinking a little bit about the idea of come for safety. And then we'll spend a bit of time thinking about come for settlement. Then I want to end tonight thinking about come for sure. We're going to two passages. We'll start at the beginning of our Bible in Genesis chapter 6. And we'll read in Isaiah and then in Revelation. First of all, in Genesis chapter 6. Genesis 6 verse 5 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. It grieved him at his heart. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, the creeping thing, the fowls of the air, for repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then just over to chapter 7, verse 1, the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Then over to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. In verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And then a few verses in Revelation, the last book of your Bible and almost the last chapter. Revelation chapter 20. We'll read verse 11. <coughs> and I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. The sea... They gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You know, as we began to read in Genesis chapter 6, we read a story that I think every single one of you is very, very familiar with the story of Noah and the ark. But first of all, as you begin to read those few little verses, they're found in Genesis chapter 6. If you had only started back a few chapters before, you should actually be surprised to read those first words in Genesis chapter 6. Note what it says in verse 5. God saw that the wickedness of man, it was great in the earth. And if you were just reading this for the first time, I think you would immediately flip back a few pages and jump back to Genesis chapter 1. Because you would say, how could it possibly be that God had just created mankind? And now just a few short years later, God looks at this world that he created. What does he see? He sees a world that is permeated by evil. He sees a world that is filled with sin. He sees a humanity, a creation. And the very thoughts of their heart, the intents of their mind, everything they're involved in, it seems to be characterized by sin. And you would maybe step back and say, how is it possible that in just a few short years, this magnificent creation that God had made spun forth from the very heart and mind of God, absolutely perfect. How could it be that suddenly you step back and what you see is individuals who are committing sin? A creation that's marked and scarred and blackened by sin. Individuals doing things that you could hardly even begin to comprehend that they would actually do them. Individuals killing each other. And everywhere you look, what does God say? Verse 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great 
in the earth. And so people's actions, they were marked by sin. The motivations that caused those actions to begin were motivations that were rooted in a heart of sin. The results from the actions, those results were tainted by sin. Why? Because sin had entered our world. It had permeated our environment. It had become the norm. And God looks and he sees the wickedness of mankind. It says God repented himself. And you would continue to read and you'll remember the story. God speaks to Noah and he tells Noah, you've got to build a boat. I spent a, quite a bit of time talking to Rob recently about building a boat and how complicated and difficult it is. Well, Noah had never built a boat before. And God tells him to build a boat and he's going to entrust his family to that boat. And God gave him the design and God told him what to do and how to do it. And God told him to start. And Noah started. And you'll remember as you keep reading that when that boat was complete, the animals began to come and the animals entered the ark. And what does Noah do? He calls his family. Why? To come for safety. And Noah and his family, they go up that gangplank and they enter the ark. And God shuts the door. And Noah's family were just as safe the moment they entered that door as when their feet found themselves on Mount Ararat. And that storm of judgment was passed, and they were safe. Why? Because they came for safety. And God's judgment was poured out on this world. Why did God judge the world? Because the wickedness and the sin of mankind had permeated every aspect of creation, and judgment came. But there was a little family that was preserved, a little family that found safety, found a place inside what God had provided. Noah could never have designed that by himself. God told him what to do. And God shut the door and that ark was lifted up on the waves of the wrath of God. They were absolutely safe. When Jesus Christ came into the world and died on the cross, do you know why he came? That you and I could come for safety. That we could be saved. The very second that I was saved, I was just as safe as I will be in eternity. The very moment I trusted Christ, nothing else needed to be added to it. That was it. All my sins, past, present, future, paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. And I came for safety, and I was absolutely safe. Would you like to be safe tonight? We listened to Mark and Lori's message on Tuesday night, and I told this to a couple of people, but I said to my wife on the way home, how would you like to be going to bed tonight in a compound surrounded by jungle, in a country that is filled with danger? Yet you and I go into our homes and we lock our windows and we lock our doors and sometimes put an alarm on and we think we're safe. And we're not. And the only real safety you will ever found, find is found in the finished work of Christ. It's found in knowing your sins are forgiven. That his blood has paid the price for your sin. And you can be safe. Because Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Come for safety. Then I want to think over in Isaiah chapter 1. This little phrase, come for settlement. See, I think it's quite possible as you think of the backdrop of sin. that It's not hard for you to recognize what Noah's day was like. You and I walk our streets, we look at our newspaper, we turn on the internet, anything at all. And what you see is individuals who the thoughts of their heart is sin. What got me thinking about this actually was a couple of months ago. It was very late on a Sunday night. And we got talking about the reality of sin. But it's, it's really hard. It's really hard to take in, to understand that, that one sin could be awful enough that it would require eternal punishment. That it's actually true that the sins that we sometimes think are just so, so simple, so small, that those sins could require the punishment of God. As we talked that night, we, we, we talked about a bunch of things, but we began to realize this. 
You know, I can never really understand the value of what Jesus Christ has done until I understand the awfulness of an individual sin. Until I begin to comprehend how what God sees when he looks at my heart. You notice how this verse starts. Come now, let us reason together, set the Lord. Then three words. Though your sins. See, this is where it gets personal. This is where it gets so individual. So we're sitting here this morning, listening to Nick speak. He happened to say, and I was listening. He said, Mr. Morton. And I thought, there's four of us here. Who does he mean? One's pretty young. But it could have been any one of us. When God speaks about an individual sin, he speaks about specific people. You and I, we have no problem recognizing the world has sinned. It's not hard to say that, yes, those people with the terrible things they've done, they have sinned. But for me to stop and say, I, I have sinned. And for me to say, it's not a little mistake. It's not a slip. In an otherwise perfect life, just one slight moment, one slight thing happened, and, and I just happened to sin. That's not what it's saying. It's saying you and I sin because we have a nature of sin. Our lives are permeated by that sin. We might call some of them small, some of them large. God calls them sin. God measures us against the standard of who he is. And what does he see? We fall short. You know, I almost spoke tonight just on missing the mark. That's what it means. We just come short. And it doesn't matter if you come miles and miles short or if you think you just come a little short. You and I fall short of the perfect righteous standard of God because we have sinned. And that sin darkens our heart. That sin stains our lives. It marks our soul. It's seen in our actions. It affects how we think. It affects how we react. It affects our relationships. It affects our families. It affects everything we touch. Because you and I individually have sinned. And Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18 says, Come now, let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins, your sins, your sins be as scarlet. Why is that so important? Because Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Those are the only people he can save. If you're not a sinner in the eyes of God, you can't be saved. Only sinners get saved. Only individuals that recognize they actually need it. You and I have turned our backs on so many offers over our life because we didn't realize we needed it. When it comes to salvation, when it comes to my soul, that offer of salvation goes out absolutely free to individuals. But you have got to accept it. You have got to come as the one that needs it. Come for settlement. You see, the moment you get saved, the question of your sin is settled. The payment that's got to be made, it's paid. The very second. That's one of the things that amazes me about salvation. We learn about it for years, most of us. Some people get saved the first time they hear the gospel. I know a man in Toronto. We were good friends. And he told me, I was dying for a smoke. First time he ever heard the gospel. He went downstairs and he looked at a verse. And he got saved. He never heard it before. Saved. Instantly. Others of us have heard the gospel for so many years. And we learned more and more and more about it. But when we got saved, it was instantaneously. What happened? When Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. When he shed his blood on the cross. When the work was finished. I came into the good of that the very moment. I took him at his word. And I trusted him. And the account of my sin was settled. Every single sin paid for. It'll never be brought to my charge. I'll never have to answer for it. I'll never have to pay for it. Why? Because it was settled. 
You come for settlement tonight? Will you come to Christ tonight? I'm not sure why you came if you're listening in. What actually caused you to click on that link and listen tonight? Maybe you felt you had no choice. Maybe you simply were looking for something else to do. Maybe you're just lonely tonight looking for something that will fill that void. Come to Christ tonight. Come to Christ tonight. Come for settlement. In that very instant, your sins will be paid for and you'll be saved. I want to close tonight looking at that last passage over in Revelation chapter 20. And I can tell you, I hesitated whether to speak on this passage tonight or just to stop with the first two. Going through my mind over and over again were those little words, come for sure. Come for sure. Life is short. Life is fragile. One second, someone's vibrant, full of life. And just a second later, that little spark that's been keeping them going, it's gone. And they're out into eternity. What then? Come for sure. When you look at Revelation chapter 20, you look at the start of verse 11. I saw a great white throne, him that sat on it. Who's sitting on the throne? Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ is sitting on the throne. And maybe tonight you say to me, how, how can that be possible? How is it possible that a loving God How's it possible that one who gave his life for sinners, how is it possible he's now sitting on the throne and he's the judge? Because a righteous God can never permit sin to enter heaven. Because a righteous God who gave his son that whosoever will may come, there can be no middle road. One of the tragic parts, I think I can share this, of the conversation we were having a number of weeks ago was, you know, you say there's individuals who because of their sin and missing salvation will spend eternity in hell. And there's those that will be saved. But then surely, people think surely there's got to be something in the middle. It can't be so black and white. There's got to be something in the middle. Dear friend, tonight there's not. When I read this passage, it tells me there's not. There's those who are lost, and there's those who are saved. There's those whose sins are forgiven, whose account is settled. And there's those whose sins have never been forgiven, whose account has never been settled, who are lost for all of eternity. And you will either come to Christ in life, or you will face him as your judge. And I read these verses in Revelation chapter 20. And I think of what it will be like to stand before a God, the God of eternity, the books to be open. And if your name was not found there, it won't matter what your heritage is. It won't matter how many degrees or what title was written on your office door. None of that will matter. All that will matter is do you have Christ or do you not? And those that are saved will never stand before that great white throne of judgment because their account has been settled. And those that stand there that day, there's no going back. There's no second chance. There's no opportunity for a reset. Life is over. Destinies are sealed. And those that are standing there that day are only waiting to hear that final judgment. What did it say? Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And individuals who have missed Christ, individuals who have missed that open offer of salvation, who could have been saved, are lost. And lost for all of eternity. Will you come for sure tonight? Colin mentioned, you remember what it was like to not be saved. I remember it clearly. I remember sitting in unending countless gospel meetings. Wanting to be saved. 
knowing I needed it, but just not quite ready to let my pride go and just trust him as my Savior. As the Savior stands with open arms tonight, what's he say? He says, come on to me. Come on to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. And you can come for safety. You can come for settlement. Whatever you do tonight, come for sure. Don't miss God's salvation. Don't turn your back on Christ. Get this matter settled tonight. Individuals started this day vibrant, full of life. And they've ended this day in eternity. Some in heaven and some in hell. Which will you do? Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're humbled that we are given the privilege and the responsibility of speaking about him. And our Father, we pray that for every single soul that's listening to this gospel message tonight, that they would not put off the matter of salvation. That they'd have the tremendous joy of just trusting Jesus Christ as their Savior. So we pray for thy help. We pray for thy guidance. We pray for thy preserving hand on every single one that's here. <clears throat> Thankful again for the Lord Jesus. In his name, amen.